Why did that change on me? button from my side. What's up folks? Uh, get things uh, started up here. We're gonna be live inside Top Alcohol Live with Shane Tecklenburg. Uh, we'll get started here momentarily. Thanks everybody for stopping by. We're gonna do a little EFI chat, MFI chat, discussion, if you will. Everybody, uh, getting everything uh, cranked up here. Hit the share button a couple of times on my end. Well, got a few seconds. Uh, encourage y'all to do the same. So we can get more people out there. Talking a little racing today. Take a break from everything. All right, folks. Like a, again, like to welcome everybody here to the. Inside Top Alcohol Live, trying a little bit different format. We uh, we tried a couple of uh, tests uh, to uh, see if we could get Shane uh, on the cam, uh, kind of picture in picture. Uh, wasn't successful, so uh, we'll keep on working on that. If we keep on doing these live shows, uh, definitely we'll uh, invest in what we need to invest in to uh, get that up and going. But uh, without further ado, folks, this is Inside Top Alcohol Live here from the worldwide Inside Top Alcohol headquarters here in Deer Park, Texas. Uh, we are currently uh, riding this thing out like uh, many of you are out there. So uh, we definitely uh, want to give our best well wishes and prayers for everybody to uh, be able to weather this storm and hopefully uh, everything kind of levels out and we can go racing uh, again uh, in the near future. And again, I hope everybody's staying safe out there. But uh, we're going to kind of stay away from all that and uh, see if we can get our minds off of that for just a, uh, a little over an hour or so. Uh, here's uh, we talk a little racing. I have Shane Tecklenburg, uh, noted EFI guru on the show with us today. Uh, last week, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, EFI components, MFI components, how to build systems and kind of the hardware, so to speak, of the system. Uh, this week, we're going to talk a little bit more of the tuning methods and how to make adjustments and different stuff and uh, just kind of go from there. So, uh, Shane, uh, welcome to the show, and thanks again for uh, taking the time to uh, share a little bit of your knowledge with us here on Inside Top Alcohol. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on again. I appreciate it and the opportunity, and obviously we're all sitting in a downtime, so it's good to be able to talk. Absolutely. Um, kind of picking up where we left off, You know, like I said, we talked about components and whatnot uh, last week. Uh, one thing we really didn't get into and kind of segue into what we're talking about making changes. Uh, let's go over first. Let's kind of set the baseline of, in an EFI fuel system. What tools do you have? What hardware on the car are you using in a boosted application to, to make the EFI type of changes that the, we're going to kind of go into talking about changing for different conditions and whatnot? Okay, well, Notwithstanding that with most EFI systems, we also would have control of the ignition and a bunch of other things, but specifically the fuel system side of it, um, we, we would use a fuel pump just usually like what you use on something like a ProMod car. We could get away with an electric pump on something that makes less power and requires less demand, but on a ProMod, let's say, because that's something that can use both mechanical or 
or electronic fuel injection, we would have a mechanical pump and a fuel pressure regulator and a set typically of eight or maybe 16 injector nozzles and then some sort of management system, some computer that would uh, take into account several different kinds of sensors. Um, the main inputs would be engine speed and typically um, intake manifold pressure. And then, as you know, um, th th that helps us map out the volumetric flow rate of the engine as far as airflow goes. We also want to calculate what the density of the air is that the engine's, the engine's consuming. So by doing a combination of measuring the pressure in the intake manifold and the temperature, we can arrive at, a, at an air density and then apply the density part of that equation to the volumetric measurement and uh, come up with an air mass. And once we have a known air mass, we can deduce based on our air fuel ratio goal, what the volume of fuel is that's required to achieve that uh, air fuel ratio based on that air mass, and then hopefully appropriately deliver that amount of fuel through the injector into the engine. So, I mean, Obviously, EFI, the, the main thing you're correcting and changing things is, is the, the basically the, the level of boost, you know, and the temperature would be the, the main two things that you're using to kind of uh, keep the fuel curve uh, correlated to. Um, obviously, I know a lot of EFI cars have O2 sensors and, and EGTs. How much of that plays into actually... Uh, uh, correcting the fuel flow without getting too far down the uh, talking about, you know, open loop versus closed loop a little bit later here. Right. Well, the, obviously with EFI, because it's a computer, we can take in lots of different kind of sensor inputs and we can make adjustments. So the, go the goal of electronic fuel injection is to try to take into account as many variables as possible that affect the fueling of the engine and be able to apply them so that we can always achieve the correct air fuel ratio under every operating condition. Now, there's obviously going to be some sort of a, a limit to that based on the amount of sensors you can measure and whether your computer can actually do anything with the, with the information that those sensors provide. But in general, we'd like to suck out the main things that affect um, the amount of the amount of fuel that the engine is going to need and and the main things are going to be again the volumetric flow rate which is the part that you actually tune into the computer um, you tell the computer what the volumetric flow rate of the engine is and then using the ideal gas law in the background the computer can come up with the air density based on the pressure at the temperature and then once again, like I said before, work through the air fuel ratio goal process and come out with the right amount of fuel to deliver. Obviously, other things can influence that that um, that number, uh, and as many of them as you can think of. If we can come up with a sensor and measure it, and come up with a way to apply that, we can apply that to electronic fuel injection and try to once again just hold that air fuel ratio exactly where we want it, based on on you know different parameters. Um, to try and arrive at the right at the right mixture. Yeah, that's obviously you know without a, you know without getting you know too technical. I mean that's the biggest difference between besides electronic components and the hardware and stuff we've already discussed. EFI, you're tailoring the flow to predominantly you know different things you set it to, to stay, you know, tethered to whether, you know, boost and, you know, all these different calculations and, you know, how much priority you give things where the MFI side of things, it's, it's all about, you know, what jets you have, the amount of pump, the flow that the pump will flow and the jets and the nozzles and everything that you have within that to how much is being bypassed to the tank, how much is going to the engine, how much, overall nozzle area you have in the entire system that's going to regulate pressure you know again last week we talked about mfi is very much about engine rpm and pressure you you, you tailor a mfi system around staying within a window of flow and pressure that you you're, you're trying to achieve and so while the mfi system doesn't have the ability to correct on you know you know boost or you know 
EGTs or O2s or, you know, intake temperature or all these different correction factors that you have with the EFI system, but it's being mechanical and, you know, being attached, you know, it's a mechanical fuel pump. So the fuel flow is going to do what the engine RPM does. And, you know, specifically in the supercharge applications, which that's predominantly where MFI systems still live is in a supercharged, you know, specifically roots or screw blown application. Uh, you know, as boost goes, you know, the, as engine RPM goes up, the boost is going to go up, the flow is going to go up, uh, you know, the whole, you know, fuel pressure. So everything's going to stay connected. So, um, you know, that's how everything kind of stays relative in, in that sense. But, you know, the boost curve is not linear, obviously. Um, different types of superchargers, uh, root, screw, how much overdrive, also how fast you're going, ram error, the whole nine yards all, you know, comes into play. And so, uh, again, we use different things, whether it be as simple as a traditional, what we call a high speed, which is another jet on a higher pressure check valve that is designed to flatten the fuel curve out, you know, as the you know, as the boost kind of starts to die off and, you know, not quite as linear. Um, also, uh, we can do different things uh, with just using electrically operated lean outs on and off, which um, obviously is an analog type of system compared to, to what you're doing. But, and I know there's some people that have probably played around with some different hybrid type of stuff of, uh, you know, using some uh, things, uh, some data going down the track to, uh, to change some things, but in the NHRA world of, uh, you know, top alcohol and pro mod, uh, well, maybe it is legal in pro mod because y'all can run EF5, but, uh, in our world of top alcohol, it's not really uh, legal to have anything correcting the fuel system going down the track, but the thing, uh, you have to have it all set up right for it to be right. But the nice thing about the MFI system is that once you get a good baseline and, you know, have a good tune up and have a way of keeping that tune up, you know, kind of tied into how good or bad the air is, it's going to pretty much, you know, do what you tell it to do. It's just a matter of telling it the right thing to do. Yeah. You, you have the same exact thing in, in EFI. I mean, obviously it's, it's dependent on the user and the user's understanding of the fundamentals of the system. Um, you don't just buy an EFI system off the shelf from a manufacturer, bolt it on your car and go run. Um, I wish it was that easy, but it's not. So it has to be tailored to the system. Obviously, you need mechanically the capability to deliver the fuel that the engine is capable of of, uh, of needing or, or requiring. Um, and you know what? You don't, just because EFI uh, has the opportunity to be complex and take lots of things into account, um, it doesn't mean you have to have to run it that way. I mean, uh, you could, in fact, run the engine off of just simply the two load inputs or the two inputs of engine speed and or uh, manifold pressure. Or you could, in fact, on a supercharged engine, run it similar to a mechanical system where you only use throttle blade angle and basically deliver fuel based on engine speed only when the throttle's wide open. Uh, and and you, could, you could run the engine that way uh, pretty successfully. But the difference would be um, you would be constantly monkeying around with it as the weather changes because it doesn't have any reference to what the weather is, right? So if it was throttle position only and it was RPM only, you would just basically have an electric hillborn. Um, and you know what? You can it's, People run the engine that way. That's, that's okay. And they don't mind chasing it every time they make a run. They have to you know, look at the weather, make an adjustment for it. And in some cases with some systems, just because you can measure a parameter, a variable, uh, and use it to vary the amount of fuel going into the engine. I mean, the goal at the end of the day is to come up with the right, correct air fuel ratio. So mm -hmm. if, if you're measuring a parameter that's giving you bad information because you've placed the sensor in a place that's not related to what the engine's doing, and you, you can kind of let you can kind of walk around the pit area and pro mod it. You'll get a chuckle if you look around because you'll see some of them have the temperature sensor mounted somewhere that's completely unrelated to what the engine's doing, like inside the cabin, for example. <laughs> and they're measuring the temperature inside the, the race car. And then they're wondering why the air fuel ratio is different every time they run down the racetrack. 
Well, if you're not measuring what the engine's actually trapping in the cylinder when the valve's closed, which is what it's all about. I mean, at the end of the day, the intake manifold's a good reference because that's the last place you can check. But realistically, it's about what's trapped in the cylinder once the valve's closed. So the better job you can do at at um, nailing down exactly what's trapped in the cylinder, the better job you can do at maintaining a constant air-fuel ratio. Yeah, that's a good segue to what I was going to kind of talk about next. And uh, first off, you know, talking about where to take weather, you know, MFI um, is all about we have to, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously we have to make those changes you know man you know we have to constantly stay on top of the weather and you know make those minute changes and depending upon if you're running a bracket car or you know a top dragster top sportsman deal or something where you're really not pushing the edge you may be able to get away with really not just chasing the weather down you know minute by minute whereas in the top alcohol world running quarter mile and it's the same way you know running any kind of real real heads up uh, pro mod stuff with MFI, you got to constantly stay on top of the weather because, you know, the level of competition, in a lot of these racing series, NHRA, some of these outlaws and, you know, Midwest and whatnot and out in the West coast, you have the, you know, extreme and different series out there. You have to push the, you know, the envelope, you know, right up there to the edge and to stay on the edge without tipping over you have to stay on top of the weather. And so what we do is MFI racers and well, any racer is going to stay on top of the weather, but, uh, you know, the biggest thing really out of temperature, humidity, and barometer is a combination of, uh, you know, your day to day stuff is going to be humidity change and, you know, seeing what that term, you know, turns into as far as grains of water. Um, you know, obviously temperature plays a part and then obviously the barometer or some, you know, racers still using that under kind of, a you know, go by but uh it's basically it's just a fancy barometer but uh we we take all those numbers and a lot of people will use a program like uh, alki pro is uh kind of the newer uh program out there that a lot of people are using to uh to kind of determine and help them make those weather changes uh with the fuel system um you know jet size by less davenport has been around for a long time and been trusted by a lot of racers uh, one of the things that the, uh, the, the Alki Pro has done and kind of, a, you know, set itself uh, aside from the, uh, the, you know, the older uh, calculation systems like the jet size is it takes in a, you can manually enter what the fuel temperature is. And that's something, uh, you know, with the different, you know, as the temperature changes on the methanol, so does the density of it. So it, it takes that in account for you know, how much that jet's going to flow based on the density. So, you know, if you've got chilled fuel and, you know, you're getting into the staging lanes and, you know, making your jet call at 58 degrees fuel temp, well, that's going to call for a different jet than say, if you don't chill your fuel and your fuel has been sitting out in the sun and you have 92 degree fuel temp. And so uh, that's something though, you know, as a MFI tuner, we try to take all that in consideration. I found over the years that the best possible, uh, in my experience, the best weather station is to, to have a pager type of system where you got weather stations staying in one central location. Um, you know, you're, you're not kind of, okay, what was, you know, the handhelds work, but you get into a deal of, you know, what the weather was, you know, at the pit and then you get the staging lanes. And then me, I'm so, uh, so anal on the weather stations. If I'm going to, somebody's using a handheld, you know, I, I want them to keep it in the shade, uh, you know, you know, because if not, then because it's a handheld and you're sampling weather from various locations, you want to reduce the impact of uh, the radiant heat on the weather station itself and throw it, you know, throw it in your curveball. Because uh, it, if you get a, if the weather station spits out a warmer reading, you know, and says, OK, instead of the DA being you know, 2000 foot is telling you, you know, it's 25, 2600 foot and you're really on the edge with the jet. Well, as it gets, you know, as the air gets worse, you lean the motor. So if, you know, you get a faulty reading from your weather station, uh, that shows you that the air is actually worse than it is. Chances are, if you're on the edge, uh, you're, you're going to be a lot closer to burning it up, if not burn it up by leaving the weather station out in the sun. Um, whereas, uh, with my top dragster, customer you know i've had several cars over the years uh 
with a, you know, pager, you know, centralized weather, weather station. And, uh, you know, in the top dragster game, it's all about consistency and being able to have everything the same, same, and, you know, do everything the same every time. And, uh, definitely was a noticeable difference having a weather station centrally located and, you know, not, not having to worry about, is it in the shade? Is it not in the shade? Um, you know, a little bit more of a real world deal and centralized location. And I mean, cause what we're doing is pretty much a, a relative system because our program, the way we, the, how we determine which jet to put in the car is going to be directly correlated to the weather station we're using. Um, you know, you can't, everybody's weather station a little bit different so you can't just go next door and say hey you know what do you what do you got for air you know well you know your weather station may say 2100 foot and this guy's may say you know 1700 foot and so they're both right it's just whatever the you know calculations or you know one may have a little bit different barometer or you know whatnot so that's a that's that's a huge part of what we do and obviously without having a map sensor and different sensors at the efi system has to, to compensate, uh, you know, the fuel flow and, you know, everything based on the conditions, you know, we have to get that right and basically set that up mechanically, you know, with jets to, uh, to achieve our desired, uh, you know, fuel flow going down to run. Now with that in mind, um, obviously the EFI system can make corrections based on the boost and, you know, intake temperature and any number of parameters that you can program it to. How much do you change and take a look at the weather and make changes to your fuel map or curve, or do you have stuff that's pre-programmed or kind of, what do you, what do you do watching the weather with an EFI car? So just taking a small step back, I mean, we're both basically saying the same things, which is that information is very powerful and all those sensor inputs and calculations are, are important but they only apply again, the goal is to achieve the right air fuel ratio on the engine. So if you're using inaccurate or incorrect data, it's, it's, it's not helpful, right? So if you take your, if you take your weather station and set it out in the sun in the summer and let the sun beat down on it, get the weather station hot, it's going to give you the wrong value for what the actual air density is at the place you're trying to run. And the same thing happens with an EFI system. If you put a sensor in a place, where it doesn't accurately tell you what's going on inside the engine cylinder. This is the problem. We're not measuring it when the valve's closed. We're trying to approximate it before it goes in and say, all right, we're measuring it right before it goes into the intake port into the valve. This must be what the air is. And if we're right, we come out with the right air fuel ratio. And if we're wrong, it comes up with the wrong air fuel ratio. Right? And when you're just starting that process sooner by having the values be wrong at the pit area, you know, because you've got the weather station in the sun, so that you arrive up the wrong tune-up, and then obviously you go run. So this stuff's only useful, uh, and it's only good if it if it very accurately reflects what's going on with the engine and the operating condition of the engine. So uh, now that I went that direction, I forgot what your question was. So tell me to ask me that again. Basically, uh, what what changes? Uh, okay, with an EFI system, you know, boosted deal like we're talking about a pro mod or you know different you know type of uh, cars we're tuning here uh what, what do you look at what do you i mean what do you watch with the weather and do you, are you going in and oh, yeah. making any changes to do the to the to your map or whatever you want to call it based just on the weather right so it depends on the system and maybe depends somewhat on the car um with the system specifically that i have uh say the pro mods that i've been working on at elite and some of the cars i work on the west coast and when i worked on in bahrain uh, those systems, I've found ways to very closely approximate what's going on in the engine to the point where, as the weather changes, I don't have to do anything. Literally, the ECU figures it out on the fly. It makes the adjustment based on, you know, the, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure and the air temperature, and it achieves the correct air fuel ratio without using a closed loop feedback sensor it calculates the right amount and comes up with the correct result. But some systems aren't capable of doing that. And sometimes you can't put a sensor in a place that gives you a representative value uh, of what's going on inside the cylinder. Like when I worked in pro stock with the system that they use, we found that it was more consistent if we took all of those parameters away and basically went back to 
a throttle position based and RPM based fueling strategy like a mechanical system would be and then adjusted the uh, the air fuel ratio uh, by trimming in or out by percentage based on the relative air density. So we'd use just like you guys a weather station with the weather station say look relative air density is you know 1.02 percent so add two percent so you basically tune the engine at some corrected value when you have it when you have the engine running right and then you constantly float up and down based on what the weather correction is doing uh, and the and the change in air density and be, because we were able to more consistently deliver the right mixture we chose to go that direction instead of trying to use sensors to get there and do it on the fly now we also were running gasoline obviously and gasoline operates at its peak output over a very much narrower number of air fuel ratios than methanol. Methanol is very forgiving. You can be 10% rich or 10% lean of peak power and almost not affect the power output of the engine. Whereas gasoline specifically in something like a pro stock engine, which is very tuned to the very edge of, of the knife edge of, of uh, the air fuel ratio is very important to try to hold that exact number and elimination of the variables that we were able to uh, measure with the EFI system actually gave us a better result. Now, that doesn't mean that that's what those guys are doing these days. They may be doing something different, but back when I was playing with them, when they first switched to EFI, that's what we found. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, your goal, once again, is to try to achieve the proper air fuel ratio. And hey, it's a race car, right? So if it was just an engine running on a dyno, that'd be one thing but you're trying to run a race car down the racetrack. So all of these great concepts and ideas and capabilities uh, in an EFI system are only good if they can help you go quick or fast or turn the wind light on down the racetrack. And so doing all this extra stuff, uh, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't meet the goal in the case of a race car of going quick or consistently quick, uh, it's kind of, kind of useless. It's nice to talk about, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't help, no point in doing it. Yeah, uh, one thing I was going to ask, you know, kind of follow up on the weather question is specifically what we see makes a big difference is uh, humidity. Um, now, you're saying that you, you know, obviously by saying that you're not chasing the weather, do you find different things within the engine that correlate to what the changes in humidity does to, to what the engine wants? Or uh, is it a type of deal where, OK, you know, one week you're racing in Vegas and you have, you know, kind of a map for Vegas, but then when you come down to the swamp here in Houston, um, do you just make a kind of a global, you know, a change across the border? Do you have ways of monitoring stuff that correlates close enough to the change in humidity to, to be able to kind of let it eat? The humidity affects the air fuel ratio in a very small way. Uh, even from 100% humidity to zero, we're talking maybe 5%. So it's not got a very big influence on air fuel ratio compared to say pressure and temperature, but obviously it still has an effect. Um, there are humidity sensors that you can run on the engine. And I've run them before and you can correct for the humidity uh, as it goes into the intake manifold. Um, there's also the ability to say, all right, if we can run a closed loop control using a feedback sensor, an oxygen sensor and exhaust, then we can arrive at the correct air fuel ratio with our calculations and hold it there for the varying variation in humidity by using a closed loop control. Um, but typically the humidity, even though it doesn't have much of an effect on the air fuel ratio, it does have an effect on the burn rate. And so the ignition, which is sort of a separate topic uh, to what we're, to what we're talking about, we're trying to keep them separate so we don't just totally muddy the water with everything. Um, is, is something is something different. So when I go from, say, Las Vegas with a turbo fuel injected car and I go to Woodburn where I'm suddenly at sea level, I have a thousand feet less altitude. I have a bunch more barometric pressure. I have a bunch more water vapor in the air and I have some uh, inflated pressure numbers there because of the water vapor. Um, I don't have to do anything with the air fuel ratio of the engine. But what I do have to do is adjust the ignition advance. And that's something that I do through a spreadsheet in the background. 
I don't tie it into the EFI system. I just I just do it based on experience with that engine. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Uh, same type of deal with the MFI system. Some people may run, uh, obviously, uh, get away with a little bit more timing. Uh, you know, when the, you know, got more grains of water in the air. Um, you know, some you know the different you know fuel system programs will make some changes uh, based on that, and uh, you know kind of what you were talking to backing up a little bit about, you know, the making changes based on what's happening in the engine. Uh, you know, that's one of the things the Alki pro system has uh, kind of done is try to make changes based off of, uh, you know, the, the, the cooling effect of the methanol and the injector hat, which, uh, we can uh, talk a little bit more, uh, here in just a minute before we uh, change gears. But the, uh, that's uh that's definitely uh, one of the things. And I mean, as somebody, several years back that didn't know anything about EFI, you know, and I think as you kind of peel the onion back, uh, you know, but one of the misnomers and I think misconceptions about the EFI system is gen in general is that it's kind of a, oh, well, it's got, you know, all these corrections and it's just kind of a set it and forget it. You, you put, you know, you know, get somebody to send you a good, uh, you know, run file or whatever. And, you know, you just, it just goes out there and does it itself. But I mean, still, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of setting things up and making changes along the way. Well, it depends on how you measure whether it's uh, successful or not. Uh, if you're measuring with a very accurate air fuel ratio it, uh, sensor, and you're you're looking at what the engine's doing, and and you're able to measure that accurately, uh, you can see that a lot of times, without making corrections or some of the corrections being made are not achieving the air fuel ratio you want because you've got a way to measure that but if your level of acceptability of the system functionality is well the engine didn't blow up when i made that run you can see it could be quite a bit different in air fuel ratio as long as the engine doesn't blow up if that's your only level of go no go then <laughs> you know that's obviously something a different measuring stick right so it's, it's just you can be very precise with efi and if you are are trying to be precise with it um you know it's, it, it helps you get right to the edge and stay there because you can literally you know see right where the edge is all right so we've been talking setting things up uh you know whether you know getting things before the run let's uh let's fast forward to after the run car comes back you're pulling up the data logger and whatnot what does shane t shane tecklenberg look at when he gets back to analyze and say, okay, did this car specifically talk a fuel system right now? You know, did it, is it where I want it? What, do you, what are you looking at and where do, what do you look at to make any changes? Well, the fastest thing using the data is uh, the air fuel ratio sensor. So if, if we're running an O2 sensor uh, in the exhaust, the first thing to look at is, is the O2 sensor. But there's really no specific tool in in a tuner's toolbox, whether it's a carburetor, mechanical injection, or EFI, I mean, at the end of the day, the engine has to run right. And for the engine to run right, it needs fuel, air, and spark, right? Simple. Uh, everybody always wants to blame the box that they don't understand for, you know, whatever's going wrong with the, with the system. But in, in reality, it, it's kind of a, it's a multi-tiered approach uh, that helps you decide what the right thing to do is with, with the engine. So, you know, once again, in the data, yeah, obviously you have the, the, the number one most obvious signal is air fuel ratio. Did it hit the goal that I wanted? Yes or no. It did? Okay, good. Now maybe secondarily go have a look at the EGT. Or, hey, it didn't hit the air fuel ratio, ratio I wanted. Hmm. Look at the EGT real quick. See if we can determine if there's a problem going on with a cylinder not running. So let me step back. An O2 sensor, uh, a lambda sensor, uh, an oxygen sensor, literally all it does is compare oxygen inside the exhaust pipe to oxygen outside the exhaust pipe. Now, the sensors that we all run are called wideband sensors. That's because they're able to accurately depict various air fuel ratios uh, well above the stoichiometric number of the, of the fuel you're running, all the way down to typically about 35 or 40, 40, 45 percent rich, richer than stoic. A normal oxygen sensor has a sensing element in the exhaust stream. It has a reference chamber that's connected to atmosphere outside the stream. And when we get the engine to a mixture that is said stoichiometric, 
That means the chemically correct mixture to combust all of the oxygen in the fuel in a laboratory. There will be zero oxygen left over. And at that point, the output of a normal oxygen sensor uh, is at its maximum. It's at its maximum when the out when the differential across the sensor is the greatest. So stoichiometric, we are no oxygen in the exhaust stream, oxygen in the atmosphere, full output. But it's not able to depict values of air fuel ratio below that. All it knows is it got to zero, but it doesn't know how far beyond zero it's gone, if that makes sense. So what they've done with a wideband sensor is effectively take two sensors and stack them on top of each other in such a way that they still have a sensing element in exhaust. They have a reference chamber that used to be hooked to atmosphere, but it's now hooked to the sensing element of a second sensor. And then they have the reference chamber of the top sensor connected to atmosphere. It turns out that if you force current backwards across an O2 sensor, you actually can turn it into a pump. And it will pump oxygen backwards from the atmosphere into the reference chamber and or from the reference chamber into the exhaust stream. Now, the deal is, because it's an oxygen sensor, it doesn't know anything about fuel. All it knows is oxygen. So if I run the engine richer than stoic, which every engine that we work on runs richer than stoic by several, several percent, typically it takes about 15 percent more fuel than it should take in a laboratory to make sure that you combust all the fuel in the, in the engine that is, that's able to, to process. So on gasoline, we typically run about 15% richer than the chemically correct number. And the oxygen sensor, wideband oxygen sensor, is able to uh, set when the, when the oxygen level drops below zero, the pump section of the sensor begins pumping current in to try to maintain a constant reading inside the reference chamber. So as oxygen is leaving the, ex the, the reference chamber and going into the exhaust stream, it's pumping oxygen from the outside into the reference chamber to try to hold it constant. And by measuring the amount of current that it takes to do that, it's able to deduce what percentage more than stoic the mixture is in the exhaust up to a certain point. So uh, the sensor is happily measuring you know, and pumping current in because there's, there's a lack of oxygen in the exhaust. And suddenly we have a misfire for any particular reason, including the mixture's too rich, uh, the ignition didn't happen, uh, the mixture's too lean, there's no fuel. Anything that causes oxygen to not be burned in the engine passes it through into the exhaust system. And as soon as it does, the oxygen sensor says, hey, there's oxygen in the exhaust. Change the mixture, report it to a leaner number because the oxygen now that's in the exhaust is going to try to migrate into the, the, the sensor. So the amount of current that it takes to measure is different. And of course the sensor reports a lean condition, even if it's a rich misfire, got that. Even if it's got fuel, that's so there's so heavy in fuel that it can't combust. It still reports a lean value. So this becomes the problem with relying on an oxygen sensor, of course, is that it can lie. So if you, if you, if you base your whole tune up around the closed loop control of the electronics and, and a sensor, which is inherently behind the process because it's in the exhaust and it's also in a really rough environment, uh, you're kind of asking for it. So, um, now I've kind of climbed down this wormhole of closed loop control. <laughs> it's idea. We're going there anyway. Go there, but anyway. We're going to go there anyway. Yeah. So whatever you originally asked me, I don't remember ask again. So, uh, after the Short run, after the run, you're looking at the data. What are your kind right. of your, you know, like, right. like for instance, my, I come back from a run, same type of deal, pull it up, uh, you know, get, get the race pack, whatever the data system is up and lo loaded. Um, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to glance at a couple of things, you know, look at the EGTs and just real quick reference, make sure you didn't have one climbing, uh, yep. you know, make sure something's not out of whack. I've never worked with anything O2. Uh, sensors. So that's kind of out of it. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to one, I'm going to look at, pull up my fuel pressure, pull up my fuel flow and pull up, you know, what we call CCs per turn, which is basically a, a, just a math channel of, you know, fuel flow versus engine RPM to make sure that's, you know, it's going to be flat for any given. Yeah. It's going to be a flat line for any given, you know, as you open jets up, you know, you'll see little steps in the CCs per turn. So what that tells me is one, if it's flat, I don't have a major fuel leak or something like that. You can tell if you've got a fuel line loose or something like that. If it's not linear, you got a problem. 
Two, it may, you know, let you know that your fuel management, your jets are open and closing uh, where they're supposed to. So that's kind of a reference check and then going out there. But for me, uh, uh, you know, like I said, it's all boils down to fuel, air, and spark. And, uh, you know, it's just different ways of achieving it. You know, I'm going to look at, see what the plug looks like. And then also I'm going to go back in and look at the bearings and, you know, measure the bearings, you know, because I, I do a lot of tuning, you know, just based off of what, what's happening with the bearings, uh, you know, then look at the plugs and then EGT and then kind of make a, uh, make a, you know, educated decision on, or with me, maybe it's not so educated, but that's, that's a whole nother discussion. But the, uh, the, uh, but that's kind of my methodology of adjusting the, the fuel systems, you know, Okay, what do the plugs look like? You know, what did the car run? Did the car run good? Did it run good speed? You know, because ultimately the, uh, you know, the ultimate, you know, dyno is that mile per hour clock up on the scoreboard and on the time slip. So, uh, uh, you know, look at that. Look at the blower boost. Make sure, you know, the, the boost is in line with what it should be. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, make a math channel, uh, you know, boost fuel ratio, which is similar to, you know, the AFR, which y'all do with the, uh, with the, uh, you know, EFI stuff. So kind of with that in mind, what's your process? We already talked about looking at the O2s. What yeah. are some of the other things you look at the engine, both, you know, electronically through the EFI, you know, data acquisition system, and then mechanically, what are you looking at? So quickest thing right off the bat, you look at the O2 and make sure that it's where it's supposed to be. And if it is, that really eliminates a lot of other things that you need to go check, right? If it's right, you go, okay, good. I know I must've had the right fuel pressure, uh, you know, the injector delivered the right amount of fuel. Um, uh, those just functioning because at the end of the day, the correct reported air fuel ratio. Now, you still have to decide whether or not the air fuel ratio that you're asking for and even that you're achieving is what the engine actually wants. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to give the engine what it wants, not what you think it needs. So, uh, obviously, you're going to go look at the EGT real quick. Just same thing, just have an eyeball, make sure it's it. Nothing's crazy. You don't have one taken off. And then whack the plugs out and have a look at the plug. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that gives you an indication of what's going on inside the cylinder, which is what we're trying to control, is a spark plug. Right? So you have a look at the spark plug. You make sure that it agrees with your EGT and your O2 sensor. And then you make a decision on what to do based on those three things, not based on any one particular thing. But my thing, my philosophy is at the end of the day if two things don't agree go with whatever the plug says you know because you can have a probe that's reading the wrong value you can have a sensor that's off the plug's going to try to give you a clue of what's going on inside the engine uh, that, that, wins. that trumps everything else yeah i mean you know the the egt is a you know it's, it's you know it's almost kind of like you know tell people don't fall in love with the boost gauge because sometimes uh, you know, it's just a, you know, measure of pressure in the intake. That's not actual airflow. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the EGT, I mean, can be influenced by, you know, a number of things. And, you know, it, predominantly if you're a little bit low, you know, if you have the timing backed off a little bit, you can influence the EGT that way. And you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're burning leaner. You're just by, you know, firing it, you know, later, you're, you know, burning more in the pipe and influencing with the EGT. So, I mean, like I said, it's just a matter of a, uh, taking a look at the data and there's been plenty of times where the EGT doesn't match what the plug is saying. And, you know, like you said, the, the plug looks halfway shiny and the bearing measures like it's new out of the box, but the EGT is showing, you know, 1200. Well, I'm not going to go rich and rich in that hole up. You know, I'm going to say, no, nah, this, that's, you know, something, you know, I need to look somewhere else and, you know, maybe, you know, but again, that's, that's just, kind of what we, you know, what I do anyway on that. And it's, you know, again, we have a lot of similarities between these two, again, because ultimately we're trying to give the engine what it wants, uh, you know, just different yeah. ways of it. But while we're talking about EGTs and O2s, uh, before we, you know, go on some other topics, uh, obviously with the tools that you have, do you ever set parameters up, you know, kind of fail safes of, okay, uh, you know, this happens, something bad's happened and shut off or shut the cylinder or give, you know, you know, what do you typically in a, you know, heads up, you know, hardcore deal to set up things like that? In a heads up hardcore deal, typically the deal is you set up all those 
all those safeties and all those defaults and nine times out of 10, they come on when they're not supposed to. And that'll be when you're leading in the final of whatever round you're trying to win or, you know, whatever race yeah. you're at. So nine times out of 10, you turn them all back off because you'd rather fucking destroy. You let, let the driver decide whether he's going to stay in the throttle and keep running it. than then have the computer decide and have it be wrong and cost you a race. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't make some preemptive strikes. So like, uh, some, some of the software is going to allow you to take EGT into account. And if the EGT gets above a particular parameter, it may start adding fuel to that cylinder to try to reduce that, that exhaust gas temperature, uh, down to a more manageable level. Now, like you kind of indicated, EGT is really not a good way to determine air fuel ratio. Uh, it's not a direct direct measurement of air fuel ratio and it, its temperature value can be infected, uh, sorry, affected by lots of things that aren't really related to the amount of fuel going through the engine. Um, I mean, honestly, DG strobes are very, very sensitive to the depth inside the exhaust tube. So typically what I'll see is that we're running something down the racetrack and a turbo engine has a lot of back pressure between the engine and the turbocharger. So it, any kind of a leak you have in the exhaust is amplified because the exhaust is really trying to get out of there. It's like basically got boost right on the exhaust side. So your EGT probes vibrate a little bit loose uh, and the ferrule comes a little bit loose and the probe moves up in the port and tries to come out. But maybe it doesn't make it all the way out because that'd be way too easy for you to tell something's wrong as it'd be hanging on the header. But it just moves up a half an inch. And so now that probe is closer to the OD or the, the ID of the tube than the rest of the probes and that probe suddenly has way less temperature than the rest and this is again where you know you don't want to fall in the trap you could easily and and it's almost it's almost an easier trap to fall in with efi because it's so simple to go into the software and make a keyboard adjustment to change something like the mixture in a particular cylinder um but you can easily fall in that trap if you don't pay attention i mean it's it's so common now that the first thing I do is go look and see if the probe looks like it's in a different depth because when it's closer to the ID of the tube, it reads cooler, right? It reads hotter down in the center where all these hot exhaust gas is flowing out near the edge of the tube. It doesn't read as hot. So, um, but you know, it's, it's, it, there's, that's why experience still counts. Uh, you know, you need someone with some experience to make a, a human being to make a decision that says, Hey, you know what? That EGT probe is, is reading hotter than normal or colder than normal, but instead of just reacting to it and making a change, I'm going to go see if I can figure out why it's reading that way. And I'm going to maybe use a couple of other parameters like the air fuel ratio, if you have it, or the spark plug and what the plug looks like to help corroborate the information I'm getting from you know, from any particular sensor. That goes every sensor on the car from the front bumper to the rear bumper, but specifically with a fuel system, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's definitely uh, I, I can relate to the uh, just send it uh, type of attitude. I don't know how many times, especially back when I was with uh, Chris Foster, uh, you know, we, you know, the oil pressure might be reading a little bit low, you know, backing up from the burnout or something like that. And he'd be pointing at it and I'd just look at it and tell him, bring the motor up and see the oil pressure gauge go up and point down track, you know, to the point where he's like, man, well, I, I know what you're going to say, send it. But, uh, the, uh, Usually yeah. with the kind of guys we're working with, I mean, we're not necessarily always working with professional teams where the driver's a hired professional driver. We're working with a guy who likes racing and he's managed to come up with the wherewithal to be able to do it. And he's typically the guy driving the car. And so he's also typically the guy writing the checks. So at the end of the day, he ought to be the guy that decides whether he's going to write a check for the parts or let off the throttle. So we could do a lot with warnings on the dash and try and tell him something's up. Um, but at the end of the day, we leave the decision to him to let off the throttle and keep from expiring the engine in the case that something's really wrong. Or we lose a race because we thought something might be wrong because we had a sensor that failed, but it's up to him to decide. Yep, let them, uh, let them make that decision. Kind of backtracking a little bit, I want to touch base a little bit on one topic uh, we, we kind of went around is uh, uh, fuel flow at idle and you know one thing i've noticed talking to people with efi you know compared to mfi is that uh, obviously the uh, i think the efi deal specific specifically at idle with the boosted deal um 
gives you a chance to, to run a cleaner idle, uh, you know, a little bit more precise control. Whereas uh, with the MFI system, you know, we're, you know, for years and years, people, you know, you'd hear people talk about, you know, where do you have your barrel valve set at? Where do you, you know, what percentage leak down is, uh, you know, by using a, you know, common, uh, you know, pneumatic leak down gauge. And a lot of people still, still go by that, but we found over the years the the, the ultimate way to set your float your set your fuel flow you know your barrel valve is your fuel flow at idle using the flow meter which is a lot easier nowadays that we have uh you know dashes to be able to you know real time take a look at what the uh, fuel flow is because you know uh you know setting a leak down on a barrel valve which is our metering valve on a you know blown screw blown roots blown mfi system uh the uh you know, pneumatically, I mean, there's a number of different variables, whether, you know, how much, you know, air pressure your, you know, your air air compressor in the trailer has, uh, temperature, you know, you know, number of deals. And so, you know, saying, you know, there, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, you need to start at, you know, 72, 75% leak down, uh, which for those of you EFI, let me back up, you know, to kind of explain that the uh, a barrel valve is again, the metering valve is kind of the, you know, where all the fuel lines go there on the side of an, an injector hat on a blown deal. And you have like a turnbuckle, uh, you know, you have linkage on the injector. Let me get this in front. You got linkage up here on the, uh, you know, on the throttle linkage. And then you got a turnbuckle that also has an arm down on the barrel valve. So they're proportionally linked. So you, you have a spool that's closed and only letting a limited amount of fuel through at idle. And then as you go to wide open throttle, that spool completely moves out of the way. And now fuel can completely move through the barrel valve and it opens up the port down to the main jet, which is controlling, you know, how much fuel it's bypassed. Uh, so, you know, again, that's kind of how we, that's how we set the uh, idle mixture. And you can not only set just by the barrel valve, you know, turnbuckle, but also you can control, you can richen and lean the system based on your idle check pressure, which is, you know, how much fuel pressure you have to have, you know, basically the bypass fuel pressure of the idle system. Now, one thing that's kind of specific to the top alcohol world anymore is having clutch cars that don't leave on the two-step. We're, you know, a clutch blown alcohol dragster or a blown top alcohol funny car with a clutch they're having to manually bring it up to whatever their launch RPM is, which the average number these days is 7,000 RPM plus. And so that barrel valve becomes a very important part of the tune-up because we have to custom tailor the spool to have just that right amount of fuel flow at that part throttle stage, fuel at stage. Whereas, you know, when you're wide open, you can, even with the MFI system, you, if you want to pull fuel away, you just open up a solenoid, open up a jet, and it's going to, you know, pull X amount of fuel away from it. Um, obviously, it'd be very, very easy to tailor within an MF EFI system, you know, on a table of sorts. But, uh, you know, that's not really a thing in the EFI world, you know, part throttling, but at least that I'm aware of. But again, going back to that, you, you, that barrel valve, you, especially when you're, you're having a, you know, your tune up in a part throttle situation with a clutch car, you have to, one, get it set up to where it flows enough at idle to keep the engine happy. And two, you have to also keep that barrel valve spool within a position to where it gives you the proper fuel flow at stage that you're looking at for your tune-up. And so uh, that's why some, you know, if, if it's a converter car that's just going to leave wide open on a two-step, I'll just change it, you know, using the turnbuckle and not really worry about the spool position because once you stay, it's going to go wide open and it's bypassing the barrel valve. But on a clutch car, uh, you know, we'll, I'll not only move the barrel valve spool position, you know, make it richer, leaner there. I'll also go in and, you know, if I like where the stage flow is, but I want to cool it down or lean it at idle, I'll, you know, increase or decrease the idle check and, you know, basically force feed more fuel through the same type of deal. So, uh, uh obviously with, uh, before, before I hand it off to you, one of the things we look for, or I look for, um, as a tuner, you know, and I, I know it transfers over to the, you know, any race car is, you know, my idle flow is I'm trying to achieve a desired head temperature when that car rolls into the beams. And I'll kind of hand it off to you to see how y'all handle the, the idle uh, side of things in the EFI world. Yep. So normally speaking, um, 
Well, okay, so first of all, as it relates to whack and the throttle, um, we have an additional circuit that you don't have with a mechanical system, which is an acceleration circuit or an acceleration calculation that happens inside the computer, kind of like an accelerator pump on a carburetor. So basically what happens when you go from an idle mixture and you whack the throttle wide open is that the fuel that's being delivered to the engine on a consistent basis under sort of conditions that aren't changing, like at idle speed or some constant engine load and engine speed, uh, you have kind of a one-to-one -one transfer between what's being delivered by the injector and what the engine is actually consuming. But really, because the injector is located outside of the cylinder, we really have a, a wetted area, an area between the nozzle tip and the intake valve seat that has some amount of liquid fuel stored on it. And it's effectively a puddle that we're constantly feeding into, uh, and then some amount of that puddle is evaporating out. And under a, a constant condition like an idle speed, um, we have a, a, a constant one-to-one -one give and take where we put in a certain amount of fuel and the exact same amount of fuel evaporates and goes in the cylinder, so we achieve a particular air fuel ratio. When you whack the throttle open and the manifold pressure increases, the pressure increase causes all the fuel that's, that's evaporating to not evaporate as it was in the steady state condition. And so you end up with a lean mixture for some number of cycles until you can build the puddle back up with fuel and get it going into the sonar like it's been going at, at the steady state condition you left from. So you need an acceleration enrichment to cover up that, that lean spot when you snap the, when you first snap the throttle open. Now, your option is, if you have a carburetor or if you have EFI, you can run the engine at whatever the optimum air fuel ratio is that makes it idle the best. So, typically, just like a carburetor on an EFI engine, I'll just adjust the mixture regardless of what that reads in air fuel ratio until it idles with the, with the smoothest, highest idle uh, for any given throttle. Um, and then I have the acceleration enrichment circuit that I can use to make up for that lean spot that I'm going to see when I snap the throttle open and go to full throttle. The other option is you have to run the engine rich enough at an idle that the extra fuel inside the port is still enough to cover up the lean spot when you snap the throttle open. And I think that's where you're at with a mechanical system because you don't have a pump. You basically have to run the engine rich enough at an idle to cover up the, the lean spot when you snap the throttle open. Now, as it pertains to a drag race car, instead of strictly adjusting the idle speed for the smoothest and highest idle speed for a given throttle opening by changing the mixture, we're going to add some additional fuel to the engine and richen it up to do exactly what you were talking about, Will, which is to try to, at the end of the day, achieve the same cylinder head temperature when we leave the starting line, whether that's with a clutch or with a trans brake, a turbo or a blower. We want the engine to try to be in the same spot every time we let the we, we go to leave the starting line so that we can eliminate that variable uh, as as it pertains to our tune up down the racetrack so we, we just just one way to try to you are effectively using the fuel system because methanol has a high heat latent heat of vaporization and we can run a lot of it and it doesn't really affect the engine so we typically will rich drop the engine at an idle so what that means is you get the engine to idle at the optimum uh, air fuel ratio by changing the mixture up and down until it has its highest idle and then add fuel and drop it a few hundred RPM uh, on the rich side just to add some cooling system to control the temperature of the engine uh, while sitting there idling between when you start it to a burnout and when you go to make a run. Yeah, so it's the same, same deal as you. Well, you know, the thing that the downside is, you know, and it, it's no real secret. I mean, you know, people, over the last, you know, five, 10 years have kind of figured out that the cool cylinder heads is the way to go. Um, and so, but to achieve that with an MFI system to keep the heads cool, you got to run the thing really rich and idle, um, you know, and the, the downside is that you end up puking the oil up and, you know, that turns a lot of people off and, you know, you, you kind of get into this pit discussion and I see people, oh, well, you know, it's puking the oil up too much. I'm like, well, are we, are we here to win races? Or are we here to see how many runs we can get out of the oil? Um, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, in a top dragster situation where we're not pushing the edge and trying to get maximum longevity, I run the thing a little bit leaner on idle just for that fact of, uh, I don't have to change the oil every time. 
Uh, whereas on a heads up deal, it's, it's not an option to run the oil more than, than once, uh, you know, basically just trying to keep the thing cool at idle and, uh, you know, but the downside is that, that it, you know, you have to run the thing rich enough that it's, it's going to puke the oil up uh, while it's idling. Um, and I know talking to some of the EFI guys that they're, you know, that switch from MFI or whatnot, whether, you know, different applications, classes. Uh, one thing they do say is that the, uh, the oil definitely lives a lot longer because it doesn't see all the pollution at idle because of, you know, just the controls and whatnot. And I just, I never really follow it up with, okay, well, you know, okay, is that just because you're running it leaner or is it because of the controls and, you know, the, that you can achieve a, you know, by not just having to flood the thing constant flow like we do with an MFI system, are you able to give it the amount of fuel it wants to stay cool? And by cool, I'm, I'm talking, you know, you know, 140 and below cylinder head temp, you know, going into the stage beams and, you know, try to, you know, keep it below that. Uh, you know, whereas I, I don't, I don't know because I don't have the experience with the EFI stuff. If that, if y'all are able to really have a nice clean idle, not puke the oil up and still keep cylinder head temp, you know, in thereabouts or lower. Yeah. Well, I think you're talking about two different things, right? So we could both be putting the same volume into the engine. Um, but it, maybe I'm talking out my ass, but my guess is that an idle, the pressure that a mechanical system is using coming out of a nozzle is probably significantly lower than what it runs going down the racetrack. Uh, and that means the atomization of the nozzle is nowhere near what it is going down the racetrack. Whereas with an EFI system, because we always run full pressure, yep. right? We run a constant pressure. So the atomization of the nozzle is always the same. And I think that because we atomize the fuel better and mix it with the air better, we can burn the same volume, but without rinsing the oil off the cylinder wall, uh, which I think is inherently the problem with, you know, effectively pissing the fuel in in a liquid form into the cylinder. No, and no, you no, only no. burn a little bit of it, and a lot of it it gets used to rinse, you know, rinse rinse the fuel off the cylinder wall. Uh, and I think that may be why it, it tends to pollute, even if we ran both of them with the same actual fuel flow at an no Yep. That uh, that's a, that's a good explanation there. Um, okay, while we're uh, while we're talking uh, atomization, um, this is kind of something, uh, and I don't know the, the the buzzword over the last few years, and you know everybody's talked about is uh, you know spray bars. Um, you know the, that's that's the you know everybody got real big on it, and obviously in some applications it, it works better than others, and then. You know, the talk around the water cooler is, you know, that's what they're doing to make pro chargers run better and maybe turbos and just that and the other. Just, you know, trying to cool the intake temperature down. Um, before we talk about centrifugals and turbos and, you know, intake temperature relative to what you do with the fuel system. I know one of the things uh, that some people have had problems with with the EFI combination in a roots blown or screw blown application is the flow through the supercharger obviously it has to have fuel going through it to keep the rotors lubed all the time uh in your setups and experience and whatnot how do you kind of tackle that problem specific to the roots and screw superchargers well that's a that's a really tricky thing and um yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're basically right on top of it. The, the problem, I keep, remember I keep preaching that an EFI system uh, is intended to be used with a constant pressure across its injector. So, you know, if we run 100 pounds of, of uh, base pressure without any boost on top of the engine, as we add boost, the pressure goes up one to one, and at 50 pounds of boost, we would have 150 pounds in the rail, 50 pounds in the manifold, and therefore still 100 pounds across the injector. But when you start mixing injectors with a common fuel system regulated off of, um, off of the same place and inject the fuel in different locations on the engine, you're in fact affecting the volumetric flow rate of the injector. So what I, what I mean by that is if you've got the system set up so that you have the standard injectors and the fuel rails down the ports, that are seeing the boost on the outlet side of the injector and have their pressure regulator referenced to that pressure so that they maintain a constant pressure. And that system is also tied to the nozzles that are on top of the blower, which has no boost on the end of the injector. 
you've now varied the flow rate of that injector on the top of the blower, right? Because it's referenced to the same pressure that the manifold sees, not what the top of the blower sees. The top of the blower doesn't see boost, right? So you've effectively made the injectors larger on top of the injector, on top of the, the supercharger. And so balancing that out without separating the system into two completely separate systems is just about impossible. Um, but the good news is they make two stage fuel pumps. So basically you can run a mechanical pump with two different stages on it. Um, one stage reference to manifold pressure under the blower for the injectors that reside there. And another stage reference to the pressure on top of the blower for the injectors that reside there. And now that you've got the pressure drop across the two sets of injectors constant, it's much easier to set the relationship or ratio of fuel on top of the blower to fuel on the bottom of the blower because you're dealing with a constant, a known value. So then it's strictly a matter of de deciding in the software what percentage of the fuel do I want going into the engine to go through the blower versus how much through the port. And it effectively takes care of itself. Now, it doesn't all the way because when you start mixing fuel on top of the blower and then letting it go wherever it wants to once it gets into the manifold, the air and the fuel come out of the bottom of the blower and act a little bit like a cyclone. Uh, they're kind of going all over the place inside of the manifold. And so you're, you're then dealing with different cylinders that have different mixtures based on the amount of fuel that's coming in from the top. And so you want to trim the cylinder that you, you know, that you're having an air fuel ratio problem with down below. And it gets tricky then because now we're dealing with different percentages again, right? So it's, it's a little bit of a game. Um, but anyway, that's that's how you would do it with an EFI system if you were if you were trying to have nozzles on the top and the bottom of the blower. What a in that type of application, I mean, do you have some that are just running a hundred percent, almost like an MFI nozzle, or how do you do you just have how do you kind of oscillate? You know, obviously it's dependent upon whether we're talking about a roots or a screw, you know, type of deal. But you know, obviously fuel has to be constantly going through it to keep the rotors loop. So how do you kind of tackle that part of it? Well, you, you, you phase, you offset the injection point, right? So that you don't have any, any, any particular two injectors on top of the blower firing uh, at the same time. So there's no gap, basically. There's always fuel. When one stops, the next one's going. Uh, the other thing you can do, depending on the volume of fuel that you need to pass through the supercharger compared to the total amount, is size the injectors on top of the supercharger so that to achieve the percentage of fuel flow you need through the top, they effectively are on nearly all of the time. And that also closes down the window of opportunity for air to be sent through the supercharger with no fuel being mixed with it. So in other words, you could run a littler engine on top of the supercharger than you run at the port. The combination of the two gives you the total fuel flow that the engine needs for the amount of air it's going to use. But by using the littler injector on top of the supercharger, you can extend its on time without changing the fuel flow rate uh, compared to the bottom injector so that you, again, have, a, have a, a longer period of time with each injector firing. And so you eliminate the, the possibility of having a certain percentage of time where no fuel is going through the blower at all. Right on. Okay, well, let's uh, let's change gears to you know the other boosted applications out there, the the centrifugal superchargers and the the uh, turbochargers, which obviously two different worlds. But is there anything out there that you can, or maybe not even be able to comment on? Maybe you know hush hush Asian orange type of stuff. But uh, the uh, uh, or is there stuff out there or to to try to put fuel downstream to kind of take, especially with methanol, to try to take advantage of that. Uh, that cooling effect, uh, you know, the, the vaporization of it and trying to do things to kind of offset and chill the or cool the uh, intake charge? Well, uh, it kind of goes back to the thing I was talking about earlier where it uh, depends what you're measuring. And in, in, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is fuel the cylinder correctly. And so adding fuel upstream uh, at the throttle body to spray over the top of your intake charge temp sensor so it looks cooler doesn't necessarily mean that the mixture that arrives inside the cylinder at the valve is any more or less cool uh, than it was by just the fuel coming in where the port nozzle is. 
So just because you can make your sensor look cooler, it doesn't necessarily mean the engine's any better. The engine would have to prove that to us on the dyno, or it would have to prove that to us down the racetrack. Obviously, if you put upstream nozzles on the thing and spray fuel in at the front of the throttle body or where the blower is or whatever, and the speed comes up, everything else being the same, or the power comes up on the dyno, then you've done something that's good. But I think with the amount of fuel volume that we're sending through the engines, even down at the port, uh, I don't know that we're making much of a difference in the cylinder with the when the valve goes to close as far as air density by cooling the charge off a little bit before it gets to the injector where most of the fuel is anyway. Maybe it's different with the FI2, again, due to atomization. It could be that breaking that fuel up into smaller droplets helps it evaporate better, and so adding fuel upstream has less of an effect. So I'm not saying don't do it, and I'm not saying to do it, but I'm saying if I was going to do it, I would try it, make sure that it made more horsepower, and then I would you know, obviously run it. And if it didn't make more horsepower and it just made my air temp sensor look cooler, what are we trying to do? Make the graphs look good on the data or go fast down the racetrack? No doubt. Um, you know, the, the spray bar deal, I mean, obviously it's pretty prevalent in the root stuff type of deal. And, uh, I think, and again, this is me, I think, I think it was Darren Mayer who came on the website and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when everybody was, uh, talking about whiz bang, uh, uh, you know, spray bars and whatnot, uh, the, what he found on his dyno and the screw application was that the spray bar and a screw blown deal made about 40 more horsepower up until about 8,800 and then didn't make any more horsepower, which, you know, it's kind of doesn't do a whole lot of good because, you know, most of what You're we're trying to make our money is above, above 8,000 RPM. Yeah. But the, uh, uh, one thing about it, you know, I, I could see kind of the theory is that, you know, when a roots, you know, by nature and just the low overdrive they have to run in NHRA and, you know, just even in an outlaw application, you just run it so much slower than a screw blower is that the, you know, there's just not enough time with the screw rotor, you know, the rotor speed and especially a funny car where you got the hat just sitting right on top of the blower for visibility purposes to, to really have a whole lot of cooling effect. Whereas with the ProMod injector where you can kind of you know, one, the rotor, the air speed's a little bit slower too. You can get an injector that, you know, has the blades further out there and, you know, give the air a little bit of time to actually cool off going into the, you know, rotors that, you know, has a, has a better effect. And, you know, I can see that also kind of playing out with the dragster stuff, but, uh, you know, uh, anything you can do to try to cool things off a little bit, one, it should make a little bit more power and two, it should, uh, make things a little bit less prone for, uh, detonation. I know, uh, that's one of the main reasons, you know, over the years that I've done stuff, uh, chilling the fuel and whatnot and top alcohol, we're allowed to, you know, chill the methanol down to 50 degrees. So we, we have to be at 50 degrees in the staging lanes, uh, or, or we get thrown out and, uh, definitely seen a little bit of performance. It's kind of, it's definitely more of a pain in the ass than just, uh, throwing some, you know, taking some fuel and fuel jug and throw it in the tank and let, let's go. Um, especially in a door car where, you know, you, you know, you typically are putting the front end on and all that and kind of sitting there waiting to go, uh, uh, you know, depending upon if you've got a, you know, some teams, you know, will have a actual chiller, you know, hooked up through an air conditioner and the fuel is just constantly uh, pumped through the chiller and, you know, maintain it at a temperature. And all they got to do is turn the pump off, unhook some lines and go to staging lanes. Or whereas some teams will actually, you know, put the fuel in the freezer and you're actually mixing a batch up of, you know, you know, 47, 48 degree fuel, putting it in the tank and going. So you kind of have to wait till the last minute to uh, fuel up an empty tank. But anyway, I mean, you know, it's, it's something we watch and something, you know, just another tool in the toolbox to try to one, cool things down and, uh, you know, to make things live a little bit longer. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I, I would rather imagine that making the fuel cooler, obviously you eliminate the variable of the density of the fuel changing because you try and run at the same temperature all the time. But also by having it be a little bit colder, uh, it's going to do a little bit better job of, of cooling the air off when it gets mixed with the air. So there's going to be a, a a density increase and therefore a power increase. Yeah, at a basic level, I tell people sometimes that, you know, it's just one little way we can try to trick the motor into thinking it's in a little bit better air. Yep. Yep, yep. Well, it, it's... Because of the turbocharger thing, uh, you know, we've I've had the opportunity to work on lots of engines that have actual 
intercoolers, not liquid intercoolers, uh, at least not chemical intercoolers, let's say, uh, where you actually run cold water, like ice water, let's say, um, through a heat exchanger and run the air from the compressor after the turbo through the, through the heat exchanger uh, and then into the engine. And the amount of difference you see by, by changing that air temperature uh, into a colder, colder number is significant, keeping in mind, of course, that the goal of the entire exercise is increasing the air density in the cylinder, not just the air pressure, right? Because we can raise the pressure up, but if we get it hot, some of our density is reduced. We obviously increase density as the pressure goes up. We decrease it as the temperature goes up. And anytime you compress anything, you add heat. And all of these different compressors, whether it's a screw or a roots, or it's a pro charger or it's a turbo, all of them are going to make the air hotter as they compress the air. Some of them are going to do a better job at making pressure versus temperature uh, than others. You know, at the opposite ends of the spectrum would probably be a turbocharger, which would be relatively efficient at compressing to a given pressure uh, versus the amount of temperature rise that you see. And the, uh, which would heat the air up quite a bit more for any given amount of um, so having an intercooler on, on one, you can, you can absolutely see the difference in the strategy and the tune up and, you know, what kind of a difference. And it wouldn't just be a small amount. You know, I mean, we're talking increase in the density by a factor of, you know, depending on where you're at on the operating range of the compressor, uh, a 50% increase in air density isn't, uh, isn't, isn't out of the question. And so, uh, a requirement would then be, of course, 50% more fuel flow to maintain the same air fuel ratio. But beyond that, you could also expect to make 50% more horsepower. Yep. All right. So, uh, going to change gears here. Cause again, uh, a lot of good information and we're kind of getting, uh, getting deep here on the time. Uh, I'm sure we can talk for a while here as, uh, we talked air fuel ratio. Um, and me and you kind of talked before the show here about this, uh, and, you know, MFI, uh, the, the number everybody kind of kicks around is, you know, boost to fuel because that's, you know, we look at our, it's just a simple math channel of, you know, pounds of boost divided by fuel flow and it gives you a ratio, you know, depending upon your particular combination and how you run it, uh, you know, I, I, some people seem, team, seem to think that there's a magic number and, you know, I've run really fast with stuff in the 3.2, 3.3 range, which would absolutely melt other engine combinations. I think part of that's due to, you know, what cylinder heads, camshafts, and, you know, different things of the way you're running it. Um, but there, you know, it, it's, it's, and I'm sure it, you know, same type of deal, you know, an AFR for, you know, an EFI situation, but one misconception, and those of you that may have read some of the columns I wrote, wrote for, you know, Drag Illustrated is that, you know, there's just one air fuel ratio uh, that, you know, perfect or this is what you need to stay at and you know I actually see people you know try to kind of really tailor their lean outs on an MFI system and tailor everything around you know stick into one you know boost fuel ratio all the way down the track and uh you know what I kind of counter and what I've seen from my experience is that you know there's a reason why you know people there's a saying it was hauling ass till it blew up you know it's because lean is fast you know and if we can you know if we were able to run leaner without blowing up we could obviously go faster and that's obviously the thing we juggle with all these fuel injection systems but you know my theory is you, you you're kind of basically lengthening in the wick of the bomb so to speak as it goes down the track by uh, so yeah and there's a number of different reasons why but i mean you know run the things leaner and low gear you know put you know and then now with multiple stages of you know uh, fuel management you know years ago we would just have you know valves that were hooked up to the air shift, you know, circuits and, you know, you'd close off one jet, you know, at low gear and, you know, then we figured out, okay, well, you know, we can split that jet up into two jets and have, you know, one jet close at low gear, one jet close in high gear. And, you know, that was kind of it. And then now we split that up into timers and, you know, all kinds of different stuff as we get a little bit more uh, resolution in there, so to speak, uh, you know, splitting things up, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on between, you know, how much load the motor has on it, uh, you know, doesn't have as much ram air and a supercharged, you know, situation, you know, roots or screw. 
uh, you know, the engine temperature is down, you know, from, you know, you're building up temperature the whole nine yards, but, uh, uh, definitely from my experience and, you know, my theory is on it, you know, is that you're, you're chasing a moving target that's based on a, a bunch of different variables and yeah, it's not going to be a drastic, uh, you know, per se, I mean, but I mean, you know, sometimes we, I lean the hell out of them early, you know, but I mean, you know, you get away with it, but you gotta, you know, always be putting the fuel in it going back down the racetrack. And I'm sure obviously within the programming of an EFI system, you know, you're, you're changing things based on boost. You're changing things based on, you know, intake temperature or whatnot. But, uh, outside of that, do you, are you setting up your system strictly on, those parameters or do you go in and say, okay, we're going to run this thing a little bit leaner earlier in the run and gradually, you know, give it fuel going down track just based on tuning, I guess. Yeah. That because you're sustaining the load. I mean, look, you can hold your hand. If you move it fast enough over the top of a, of a candle, you don't burn it. Right. But if you hold it there nice and or move across it nice and slow and give it plenty of time, it'll, you burn your hand and it's the same deal. Air fuel ratio as, it's per, as it pertains to horsepower, will be a bell-shaped curve with a peak uh, at some particular number for any given engine combination. It's not the same for every engine. It's not the same for every fuel. The, the optimum air-fuel ratio that produces the most horsepower uh, typically is a little bit of a range, uh, and, and some fuels like methanol offer a wider range. In other words, the peak of that bell-shaped curve would be a lot flatter at the top uh, and you could run several different air fuel ratios, all offering the exact same horsepower or very, very close to it. Um, and then as you drop off on the rich side or the lean side, uh, you know, you lose horsepower. And it typically you drop off harder on the rich side than you drop off on the lean side. Um, but that that is under a specific set of parameters. So in other words, if we run the engine up to 60 we know what its volumetric flow rate is. We know what the air density is at 60 pounds because we know what the pressure and the temperature are. So we know what the exact correct amount of fuel to add to the engine will be based on the air mass that it's processing and our air fuel ratio goal. But that only takes into account all of the operating parameters of the engine staying exactly the same. Now, going back to the idea of running your hand over the top of a candle, you know that if we run an engine at, at, at 60 pounds of boost and 9,000 RPM, the 15th second that we hold it there with that sustained load, it's going to have different temperatures in all of its components than it has in the first second. So the air fuel ratio that would be absolutely correct for peak horsepower output based specifically on the air that the engine's processing is going to still be the same amount of, of fuel required based on the air at the 15th second, but won't, what won't be the same is the temperature of the piston and the exhaust valve and the combustion chamber and the cylinder wall and all of those components, they'll have, they'll have absorbed heat and they will be then more prone to cause detonation or pre-ignition. And therefore, we have to send some amount of additional fuel beyond what is optimum for peak horsepower through the engine in order to cool it off. Just like what we're doing at an idle when you're adjusting the fuel flow. You're basically using your fuel system as a cooling system. And this becomes a bigger and bigger problem when you get rid of water, right? When, when we're running water-cooled engines uh, and we can, we can move the heat away from the combustion chamber in the water and we're using charge air heat exchangers to keep the heat out of the air charge, we can run the engine almost the entire way down the racetrack and make no accommodation for the amount of time that it's spending under load. We can run it at the perfect optimal power air fuel ratio from one end to the other or very close to it is in comparison, say to something that's solid that doesn't have a cooling system uh, and obviously is going to you know absorb temperature as you increase its power output. So yeah, you're going to have uh, a number of parameters that are going to change the air fuel ratio you want to run at. Uh, we have to keep the engine alive enough to at least make, you know, four rounds. So um, we can't afford to run it at peak power output all the time, all the way down the racetrack, because by the time we get to the finish line, 
the operating parameters of the engine have changed to the point where the optimum air fuel ratio, not for power output, but to keep the engine alive has been reduced. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the other thing too, is, you know, going rounds and hot lapping, you know, the motor, you know, going from, you know, first run of the day and don't have, you know, real big heat soak in the motor to where, you know, coming back, you know, 45 minutes, an hour later, uh, definitely uh, kind of got to factor that into it a little bit as well. And I know, you know, years ago, you know, working for Steve Harper, one of the things he told me, you know, taught me, you know, is to, you know, you got to keep an eye on the head temperature. And, you know, sometimes when you're hot lapping it, you know, you may just have to go enrich in the barrel valve slightly as you go on throughout the day, just to make sure that you're going to the starting line uh, with the, uh, the same head temp. Obviously you have corrections, you know, whatnot, but uh, you know, Generally, that uh, one or two runs, you know, back to back with some cool down ain't too much. But I mean, you know, talking to tuners and from experience, uh, you know, you get into that that fourth run, that final round of, you know, you know, making that fourth run within a window of, you know, three and a half, four hours. Uh, you know, definitely the everything in the race car is hot and pissed off. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, all right, so we're coming up on the hour and a half mark, so we'll open this up to uh, some questions and uh, kind of uh, put a bow on this. Uh, first off, I'll kind I of – got a cut... couple of um, – Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. I didn't mean to chop you off, but there was a couple of questions that were floating through, and I tried to answer them as best I could with one hand on a keyboard. One of them was uh, in reference to using uh, exhaust manifold pressure on a turbo application uh, and how that would be used for tuning. So, um, as you know, the, uh, you know, on a turbo charged engine, you obviously have a turbo in the way of getting the exhaust out to the atmosphere and it takes, um, the exhaust going through the turbine, uh, in the turbocharger in order to spin the shaft that runs the compressor. And the harder it is to turn that shaft, the more power it takes. Uh, and the turbine has to absorb that from the exhaust gas. And so the offshoot to that is that it creates a lot of back pressure between the exhaust valve on the engine and the turbine blade itself in the turbocharger. Um, so the pressure differential across the cylinder, when you have 50 pounds of boost in the intake manifold and uh, 50 pounds of pressure in the exhaust manifold uh, is a net zero, right? So basically it's the same if you want to, it's the same as a normally aspirated engine as far as its pressure ratio across the cylinder. Take something like a supercharged engine with a belt-driven compressor. You have 50 pounds of boost in the intake manifold. You have atmosphere in the exhaust port past the exhaust valve. Uh, so consequently, because of that pressure differential, at overlap, more air will move through the cylinder and out into the exhaust, and it will tend to flush the unburned uh, mixture or the burned mixture that hasn't left the cylinder uh, and, and clean itself out, and it'll continue doing that to a higher engine speed compared to a turbo, everything else being the same with less pressure differential. So the key to measuring exhaust pressure uh, is to compare it to intake pressure so that you can more accurately describe the volumetric flow rate of the engine. When the exhaust pressure is greater than the intake pressure, if you think about it, on your streetcar, when you're driving down the road, if it's a gasoline engine and you're part throttle, you have less pressure in the intake manifold than you have in the exhaust manifold. And consequently, at overlap, you have a backwards flow of gases from the exhaust side straight into the cylinder and maybe even up into the intake manifold. It's exhaust gas recirculation, basically. And that exhaust gas, because it's already been burned, can't be burned again, and there's no oxygen in it. And so that volume is taken up in, in the cylinder, uh, the swept volume of the cylinder is somewhat de de deprived because it's got uh, exhaust gas in it that won't combust. So effectively, the engine is smaller. It's a, it's, it's a smaller volume of air that it can actually combust. And so by measuring the percentage of pressure across the cylinder intake to exhaust, we can more accurately describe that condition and we can fuel the engine appropriately. If we were only measuring the pressure on the inlet side, disregarding the exhaust side, we would find that if we didn't make any other change, as the exhaust pressure comes up, the air fuel ratio will tend to go richer because there's less, less and less oxygen in the cylinder and we're still putting the same amount of fuel in. So that's why we would use intake pressure and exhaust pressure 
on an EFI system on a turbo. Right on. Definitely uh, learned something there. Okay, uh, one of the questions earlier in the show, uh, Andy Cowan asked, uh, surely a portable weather station on the starting line, it's real time as opposed to one two miles away. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, one in an MFI system, the weather station is somewhat of a relative, you know, uh, you know, uh, we're, I, I see both sides of it where, okay, yeah, you know, we're going to try to, you know, get the air right here versus, you know, maybe, you know, like I said, you know, some racetracks, the alcohol cars are parked down by the shutdown area. Um, I, I don't think typically there's not a huge uh, change, you know, between, you know, just in that, that short of an area to where you're going to see a significant change. Whereas, uh, in my opinion, I'd rather have the static, uh, weather station in one location, um, and, you know, have that be a constant where rather than, uh, you know, having to chase, you know, what the radiant heat heating effect on that, uh, weather station is going to be, do, you know, are you doing a good job of keeping it in the shade all the time or, or, you know, did somebody stick it in the cab of the pickup truck and, you know, sit it in the air conditioner and now it's, you know, the other way or, you know, or, you know, it's just a, a you know, a number of different variables that, yeah, the portable weather station's right there. Um, you know, one, one of my personal uh, pet peeve ones that I, 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 as far as handhelds goes is those, uh, those crustal um, uh, weather stations, which I, th I think they're a good, accurate gauge, but they almost give somebody like me too much real-time data. You know, I'm looking for, okay, I'm punching in 88.2 degrees, you know, 79.2% humidity and 29.32. Well, shit, now the, now the temperature is 88.1. You know, you know, is it, you know, is it, is it 2,920 feet or is it 2,980? I need to know right now. Okay. Don't tell me it's 2,960 now. And so uh, sometimes a little bit of ignorance is bliss there, but I, I like the pager deal um, personally. And uh, from my experience, at least with the top dragster stuff that I've done, uh, we had a couple of races where our pager weather, uh, you know, our, you know, trailer mount deal went down and uh, we have a handheld that we use, uh, you know, kind of as a plan B and uh, definitely the, uh, the consistency uh, suffered a little bit. And, uh, you know, on the top dragster, one of the ways that I go back and look at and, you know, make sure that I got the jet where I wanted it to be was, uh, you know, to go look at, you know, the average EGT, you know, so to speak, you know, just as a reference point and, you know, make sure that things kind of stay in where I wanted to. And uh, not that it was huge, but I saw a little bit more variance than what I normally see when I got the, uh, the pager weather station. So that's, that's my personal preference and why, so to speak there. So, uh, uh, I had one question from my top dragster guy for you, Shane. One, He's not a Facebook guy, so he uh, sent this to me after sec. watching. One uh, sec. Yeah, go ahead. Keep your, keep your top dragster guy, but I just want, I'm going to go back to that and just say that I agree with you. Uh, and part of the reason is because I don't have enough bandwidth in my brain to consider making a change after I've left the trailer. Okay, so I do my best work when I'm sitting in a relaxed environment i'm looking at data i'm making decisions and i have an hour and a half to figure out what change i'm going to make i don't make good decisions when i decide i'm going to do something and then i go to the starting line and i start looking at you know weather changes on the starting line and and you know what the guys in front of me are doing and then i shoot from the hip and go ah oh, fuck it let's change everything <laughs> so i would i would agree with using the value from from the trailer to make your decision i follow that up with i you know i do track the weather i have an app on my phone that i use to do it and i do it on the starting line but then i take that data and put it into the the run data so i have a reference for some other time you know to be able to to go back to but i'll have made my decision on what to do with the car from the trailer not based on what the weather changed to on the starting line when i decided to check it yeah, I mean, f fuel wise, I mean, more or less, it's not really so much a decision, um, you know, as, as it is, is just getting, okay, you know, the, uh, at, uh, you know, okay, that we're about to run and you try to cut it as close as you can, maybe a pair back, two pairs back, something like that, and say, okay, this is what the weather's going to be. And I feel pretty confident this is what it's going to be when I get into the water box. Okay, you punch that into the, the your program that's going to tell you what jet to put in it. 
Um, you know, a lot of times I'll try to, you know, kind of gauge that and look back and say, okay, okay, you know, it's calling for an 89 right now. It's warming up a little bit. It's kind of that time of day where the temperature is swinging up. It's calling for 89 back here in the pit. I'm going to go ahead and put a 9091 in it because that's what I think it's going to need when I, you know, when we get to the run. Sometimes you hit it and you don't have to change the jet and you confirm it and you make your note, okay, it's making the run with a 91. Um, you know, of course, then there's always the oil down or something, you know, any kind of downtime. And then you got to constantly uh, uh, reevaluate that. Uh, as far as a tune up decision, um, there are times, uh, typically with the, with the main jet, the, uh, not really making, you know, like you said, that's going to be a call back at the pit, you know, based on, okay, we're going to run this thing, you know, full, you know, run on normal jet, you know, run on normal program. As far as that goes, there are sometimes, uh, you know, kind of last minute, uh, you know, want to calm everything, tap it down, you know, oh shit, this track sucks or nobody's getting down it and you don't have time to get in the toolbox or, you know, change a bunch of, you know, timing stuff. You can rich in the main jet up and you're going to take power out everywhere. Um, you know, but, uh, that, that's, that's as far as, you know, tuning, you know, like decisions as far as making the car go faster or whatnot, I, I, same type of deal MFI, but just, we got to stay on top of that weather station till, you know, up to the last minute. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things I noticed, uh, you know, going from NHRA racing and pushing the main jet to, you know, some of the outlaw pro mod stuff that, you know, I did as, uh, you know, I was like the only guy with the weather station and the jets in the staging lines. They're all looking at me we're like, why are you changing the jet? Why don't you do that back at the pit? I'm like, well, I'm just used to just used to staying on top of it that much. But uh, anyway, moving on, uh, my top director guy wanted me to ask you, since he's not a Facebook guy and you watched the last episode or, or last installment where we're talking hardware, um, he's talking about the latency of injectors and whatnot. He wanted to know, he's an engineer, by the way, so that's, you know, it's the engineer question. Uh, is uh, physioelectric uh, injectors, uh, they made their way into the EFI racing world, or are they going to in any, any in the near future? I'm sure he means piezoelectric. Okay, so that's piezoelectric, right. I was, reading, I was reading that wrong. Then. Yeah. yeah, no, it's all good. So a piezoelectric injector um, is something that is used in, in direct injection for both diesel and gasoline engines. Uh, and I don't know how the technology works exactly, except that as you pass current across a piezoelectric bunch of crystals, they expand and effectively they shove the valve of the injector open and it works really good when you're trying to open against super high pressure where we're talking, you know, in a gas direct injection uh, land or even diesel land of several thousand PSI of pressure on the, at the injector. Uh, in a port injector, um, we, we, we're not dealing with that kind of pressure. Uh, so nobody currently that I know of offers a piezo. It also takes a special uh, piece of device to drive a piezo injector. Um, and there are actually both kinds of gas direct injection uh, technologies available, both the piezo and then the traditional, um, you know, uh, current drive like what we're using on a, on a, on a port injector. Um, Nobody that I know of uses piezo for a port injection, and part of the reason you wouldn't want to do that is because uh, a gas gasoline direct injection or diesel direct injection uh, is very limited on the amount of time uh, over which it can it can spray fuel into the engine, and that sort of limits those types of technologies to relatively low fuel flow um, low fuel flow flow engines. Um, for example, you know, we can spray uh, on a constant, obviously constant nozzle spraying fuel in the entire time, regardless of whether the valves are open or closed on an EFI system. If we're synchronous with the engine, uh, and our pulse width is small enough, we can time the spray to only go in on the intake stroke. Uh, but we have the opportunity to go ahead and continue to spray while the valves are closed up to the point where we basically have the injector on all the time. That's not a possibility with direct injection because uh, the fuel has to be sprayed in um, as the valve is opening. You can't spray fuel in during combustion like you can on a diesel. Uh, and you have to watch when you spray the fuel versus the, the, the piston position because you can actually spray the fuel into the piston, impinge upon the piston, burn it. So nobody that I know of is currently running direct. Uh, injection and there's a, there's a real limitation there in the amount of fuel you can get out of them because you're limited in time. Um, doesn't mean you couldn't adapt it to the intake port, but I'm not sure there would be much of an advantage at that point just bringing the port over a normal port injector. 
Right on. Uh, okay, Zach Morgan asked, uh, said, I don't have a lot of experience with MFI. Do you guys feel that MFI will always be a part of drag racing because of the simplified nature of the sport and wide open throttle only base, wide open throttle only basically? Or do you think there will continue to be a slow takeover of EFI systems as the rules and people become more comfortable with them? So I'll open up uh, one. Uh, I don't see EFI coming into top alcohol anytime soon just because I don't think NHRA, uh, it's a lot easier for an NHRA just to say no and not have to worry about it and not have to deal with any of that. Uh, two, uh, with uh, you know the, the, a common answer you get, you know because you've seen EFI start to work its way into screw blown and roost blown applications throughout, you know, pro mod radio racing and whatnot. Uh, but as of yet, we've really not seen anybody really run away and uh, show, you know, a, you know, a market increase, you know, performance or way faster or, you know, you know, kind of set themselves, you know, apart from, you know, a traditional MFI system. So uh, there's definitely a lot more control and options there, uh, you know, for that. But, we, you know, a, a lot of the answers, you know, talking to people is that there just hadn't seemed to be uh, the... Uh, the, you know, any kind of performance advantage to that. And then, you know, as one racer, you know, said, you know, I've got something that works really well, you know, mechanical and simple system that I got figured out and know how to run it. And it's mechanical and, you know, not having to, you know, deal with electronics, to, you know, to, to change over to a, a very potentially complicated system that, you know, as of yet hasn't shown that it could run any better. Now asking different, I'm sure, you know, different people have different opinions on, on that part of it. And I think at some point, uh, you know, I think at some point if EFI is going to make, make that breakthrough, somebody's going to figure something out and, you know, develop a performance, performance advantage, you know, similar to, you know, what EFI was able to do to the nitrous cars, uh, you know, to where they were able to, you know, use EFI to, you know, keep, you know, keep the fuel there and, you know, run even more nitrous because they could, you know, keep more, keep more fuel with it versus the carburetor. And I think at some point, you know, somebody will probably figure something out like that on the, uh, the, the roots and the, the screw bone type of stuff. Uh, but MFI will still be around in the top alcohol categories for the foreseeable future. And, uh, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, an older generation of, uh, racers that are going to stick with MFI again, like you said, uh, the wide open throttle nature. So, you know, it's, it's, simpler than some other forms of, uh, motorsports disciplines. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, you know, as I remind some of the, the people in the top alcohol categories, and one of the reasons why I like talking about EFI and kind of bringing this, uh, compare and contrast conversation to light is that, uh, you know, the younger generation of racers coming up, I mean, they're used to, you know, using a laptop to do stuff, uh, you know, now with the power grid type stuff and command modules and different ignition boxes that we use, you were doing the ignition side of things through a laptop. We're not, you know, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, to the same degree, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have a little bit more control over the fuel system rather than just strictly, uh, uh, you know, have to kind of, uh, do all the things we do with the MFI system. Um, but, uh, uh I think, you know, some of that will be there and I'll kind of open it up to you, see kind of what your thoughts are on that. I would say challenge accepted. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think uh, mechanical tool injection will ever go away. Um, and for a lot of the reasons that you just suggested, I, I, I do think that uh, potentially there could be some performance gains, not because EFI will make more out and out horsepower than mechanical injection. I think the refined control uh, could potentially lead to a performance advantage. And I also want to point out that uh, you heard me say that, uh, you know, we could take the car from Denver to Woodburn and literally not change anything and go run down the racetrack as far as the air fuel ratio goes. Uh, you know, if you take someone like you, someone with experience, a guy like Les Davenport or, you know, any of the other tuners for hire that are out there that are doing a great job, uh, with mechanical fuel injection, you're going to have a hard time, even with electronic fuel injection, doing a better job than guys that know what they're doing. But I would imagine that there are a fair number of guys who kind of know what they're doing, uh, and sometimes they get it a little bit wrong. And you could potentially save those guys some of the getting it wrong part by automating some of the decisions they're making. Um, because they maybe don't have a complete understanding about what they're 
what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have to have any understanding of electronic fuel injection to be able to make it work. But I think by having a computer that's doing some of the things to make the decision correctly for you, um, look, I'm sure that's why these computer programs exist, because someone could put the formulas out there in a, in a notebook. And if you were able to, to, you know, get the formulas correct and put the right values in, you'd come up with the right tune up. But it's a lot easier to give someone a computer program that says, put this in and I'll tell you what to do with that. And effectively, that's what you can lean towards with the EFI. So anyway, and, and as far as the challenge accepted part of it goes, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to work on a screw or roots blown EFI car that was, we want to do what you think we should do. I've worked on a few that were, here's what we're doing. What can you, you know, can you make it do this? Can you make it do that? Um, but I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to run a screw blown car the same way that I run a turbo car uh, as far as, you know, taking all of these things into consideration and making making adjustments for them. Obviously, you're not going to take a system set up for a turbo and simply bolt it on something with a screw blower and just assume you don't have to do anything. Um, but I think if you if you customize the application a little bit for its use, I think it potentially could have some advantages. Would everyone take an uh, opportunity uh, take it take advantage of the opportunity? Uh, no, they certainly were, aren't all going to do it. And until it can provide somebody with some sort of um, an advantage, um, there's not going to be really any good reason to go spend more money to run the same. Yeah, EFI, you just, you just, you know, there's a box where you type in desired ET and click done, right? Yep, that's it. Type in the and speed and walk away. The, uh, now, uh, okay, I uh, got one here from uh, Justin Wake. Uh, any idea why we're not seeing the screw roots clone cars running a uh, COP, which would be coil unplugged? Uh, type ignition along with the FI, the new pro charger combinations are set up this way. It seems that they could really refine their combinations going that route. And I think you answered it in a short form, but I mean, uh, uh, the, the coil on plug deal is going to completely take over mags by the end of the year, if we get to race again. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, I've really been lobbying for the, uh, them to let us use that in the, uh, in the uh, top alcohol world and you know sometimes the top alcohol rules are a little bit slow uh, hesitant to change uh you know a lot of you know people kind of resistant to change but uh the, uh the 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 you know forever we all were conditioned that you know the the msd 44 amp mag was the uh the end all be all and i mean certainly for what it can do i mean you know there's no other ignition out there i don't think that you know could quite fire nitro like a mag can especially two of them uh but you know over the years you know i've i really thought okay well you know to really run a lot of boost and haul ass you got to have a mag you know and then uh to see you know some of the you know even even seen some distributors out there you know msd distributors run fast you know you know 30 40 pounds of boost and you know certainly in the uh turbo world uh you know, y'all, y'all definitely, you know, had a success for a number of years with the coal near plug type of setup and with the top dragster that I've been tuning, we've only been out one time, but we switched it over to the MSD, uh, you know, CDI 600 deal and really just set it up exactly the same as, uh, the, uh, what we had with the pro mag and it went right, right, right down the track. And it may be one of the hardest tests for ignition system on blown alcohol because, you know, at the top dragster, we're trying to make that thing live and we're trying to slow it down to 610 and, you know, run a bunch of speed. So it, it doesn't have a lot of compression, has a whole lot of boost and a whole lot of fuel and a whole lot of timing out of it to slow it down. And it still fired it and went right down the racetrack. So uh, I'll let you kind of follow up that because y'all definitely have a lot more experience with the uh, coil near plug, coil unplug type of deal over in your world. Yeah, coil unplug and coil near plug obviously came out in the in the mid '90s on street cars to replace the stuff that wears out in the distributor, uh, being all the mechanical bump components, the uh, rotor and uh, the shaft gear and whatever else. And so obviously it was less expensive for them to build eight coils and figure out how to control them. Whether they put spark plug wires on them uh, from the coil to the engine, which is coil near plug, or they actually had the coils mounted on the engine, because then of course they didn't have to. Uh, make spark plug wires, which was coil on plug. Uh, I, everything I've worked on since I started working at, at Motec, which was in 2001, uh, has pretty much been 
coil on plug or coil near plug because all of the engines made since early 2000 have, have come with that from the factory. So it seems like a pretty natural thing to me. And obviously when I started working on ProMod stuff uh, with the team in Bahrain, we had been running engines that were from a Toyota Supra that was built in the early 90s and they came with a coil on plug. And so basically uh, with an ignition system, unlike maybe any other system on the, on the engine, uh, if you have enough, that's all you need, and more doesn't buy you anything. Um, so we never had a problem running the, the coil on plug ignition from the factory Toyota Supra all the way to 100 pounds of boost. We used uh, a capacitive discharge ignition box, which would be like what your MSD 600 box is, to fire those coils, but we used actual factory Toyota Supra coils at over 100 pounds of boost, never had an ignition problem. Uh, and so therein kind of lies the rub with switching to um, a coil near plug uh, and from a magneto. Certainly no one can argue that getting all of the mechanical things that can vary and move and swing back and forth and arc out and break off out of the way is definitely better. Um, you have some things that are advantageous about running coil near plug compared to a distributor mainly that you can swing the timing all over the place uh, and you don't ever have a problem where you cross fire inside the distributor cap. So that's good from a power management standpoint. As far as the output, there is no question by measuring it, and I've measured them with a lap scope, uh, the 44 amp Pro Mag for sure has the most amount of output energy available during the time that it's firing of any ignition system. But realistically, if it takes some number, let's just say it takes 90 millijoules, because that's the number that's being thrown out, you know, currently. That's the amount of energy that actually occurs across the plug gap, right? So um, the reason why uh, a Magneto, a ProMag 44 specifically, is so strong is because it sustains the energy across the plug gap for a long period of time, typically about 30 degrees uh, of engine rotation. And so the energy measurement is a measurement of not only how much the output is, but how long it lasts. So a really super high output, really short duration uh, spark, like a capacitive discharge, can have a completely different energy measurement than a relatively weak but long-lasting spark and give you the impression that because it has a higher mule joule, it's got more output. But I will say, again, that the Magneto certainly has the most amount of energy of anything. But once again, going back to some numbers, we'll just randomly use 100. We'll use 100 millijoules. So let's just say that it requires 100 millijoules of energy to, to correctly start combustion in a particular engine under a, a specific set of operating conditions. Using a thousand millijoules doesn't give you anything beyond what a hundred gives you, right? So in this case, if I can get by with the coil near plug coils that I use, which are about 20 amps per cylinder, uh, and that's in the primary circuit, whereas a Magneto's a ProMag 44 is 44 amps in the primary. That's not what goes across, across the plug gap, mind you. That's just what happens in the primary circuit of the, igni of the ignition coil. Anyway, when I use uh, uh, something that can output 100 millijoules, if that's all it requires to spark the engine, using 1,000 doesn't give me any advantage. So that's how we're able to jump back from the ProMag 44. Our engines don't take what a ProMag 44 can produce to be able to run correctly. That's not saying that you could run a top fuel car with what we're using. That just means we're way over the top of what's actually needed. Uh, so more doesn't help. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, I've had some experience and, you know, had some debates with some people on this over the years. And we had a situation, uh, you know, shoot, probably eight, nine, maybe even 10 years ago now, but, uh, with a customer car and we were having mag problems. And that's one of the biggest things that, I mean, I love the mags and, you know, they look cool and, you know, having, you know, having more, you know, is better, and especially in drag racing. Right. But I mean, the, the problems that can come along with them, you know, you got the RF problems that can potentially uh, cause problems yes. and, uh, 
you know, you got one coil. So if it goes weak, everything goes weak or it goes away. And I mean, you know, that that's one of the things over the years that we've seen that coils do go weak. You know, I used to think that they are either good or they wasn't. And that's definitely not the case, but, uh, you know, then generators, you know, you got mechanical things in there that need to be blueprinted and set up and, you know, have everything just right and stay on top of them and, you know, the whole nine yards. But, you know, there was, and, and maybe it wasn't a matter of output, maybe it was something else, but we had a situation about 10 years ago where we went and it was the, 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 the classic deal of, you know, this, how the story goes when ignition goes away is, uh, you know, car just kept on slowing down, kept on slowing down, kept on slowing down. Uh, we sent it to one place They came back, said it's fine. And then finally we said, okay, we're going to send it somewhere else and get a second opinion. And they did some stuff to it and we bolted on the car and go out and make the first run. It hauls ass to about 1100 foot and then it's death smoke. And so, you know, usually, especially in the mag world, uh, you know, the way that that's what I always tell people when they're telling me they have ignition problems is, well, just remember how the story always ends is that, you know, the car kept on slowing down. You keep on leaning on it, kept on leaning on it. And, you know, chasing the ignition problem, then you, you put, put, find the ignition component that was bad and put a good one in it. And, you know, next thing that happens, yeah, you go out there. Yeah. But, uh, this wasn't so much a, a function of, you know, we were, I had the fuel system on our normal, uh, where, where we called normal. And maybe, maybe it was a situation where our normal was just shit ignition for a while and this guy fixed a problem and, you know, whatnot. But we definitely, I mean, it was, it was definitely attributed to having, something fixed, whether it was better, more amperage, whatever the case may be. But we, we put a mag on and it, it went out there and, uh, burned some pistons and the lights and, you know, we had to, we had to richen it up, but, uh, getting back to that, I mean, the, you know, we, we kind of debated on the top dragster on whether or not we were going to go to the coil on plug one. We're not, a, you know, we're slowing that top dragster. I keep on mentioning it. Those of you may not be familiar. I have a screw blown Hemi top dragster running NHRA's top dragster class. We can only run 610. Uh, our goal is to run 610 as with as much speed as we can run and have the motor live forever. So it's way overkill. It's got 50 pounds of boost, but it's only got 10 to 1 compression. We run a lot of fuel in it. Thing lives forever. But anyway, going back to that, we have a refined system. We were happy with it, with the mag. It was all running good. So we're like, well, do we really upset the apple cart? But the more we thought about it was, all right, well, with the coil on plug, if, if we do have a coil go away or coil near plug, excuse me, we do have a coil go away, well, then it's just going to be that one cylinder that goes weak. You're not going to lose everything, you know, uh, you know, so, and not to mention not having to fight all the RF problems. I'm sure we'll learn some new problems along the way, but, uh, we keep on uh, getting long, long in the tooth here, but, uh, got one more question here by Andy, Andy Cowan. Do you think on EFI and MFI there will be, or is needed for more sensors? For example, individual valve temps, if possible, individual knock sensor, a lot more feedback, if possible, to engineer thoughts. Boy, giving a crew chief like me more decisions to make. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, I would love to have more stuff and, you know, be able to correct this and correct that. But, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, I think it goes back to uh, bottom line is, uh, you know, one of my mentors I learned a lot from, Tom Conway, uh, you know, told me early on is these race cars aren't that smart. And sometimes we try to get way smarter than they are. And, uh, you know, if we, I, I definitely think if there's stuff that we can find a monitor that has a real positive correlation to something we can change, obviously in the EFI world, uh, it'd be great if you could make some corrections and, you know, maybe something like that'll be a breakthrough for the EFI world uh, at some point in the future, uh, for the, you know, MFI deal, um, boy, that's, you know, that's obviously uh, knock sensors, individual valves, temp, that, that's something that's, uh, not even on the radar of anybody in the MFI world, uh, you know, definitely being able to make any kind of down track changes. Uh, but, uh, uh, I'll kind of turn it over to you. And I, I had a whole nother round of, uh, questions, a topic we was going to, you know, maybe talk about, uh, seeing if you've seen anything actual from, a actual recorded cylinder pressure, but, uh, that's, that's a whole nother, uh, rabbit hole we could go down. So I'll let you answer Andy's question about, more sensors? Uh, well, from the standpoint of trying to learn, more sensors is always better, in my opinion. And even if you don't know what to do with them now, if you have the wherewithal to be able to use them um, and accurately measure whatever it is you're trying to measure, I think later on when you actually understand what to do with the information, you'll at least have it and you can make a decision then. However, 
the question becomes, is it actually useful for the goal, which is making the race car go down the racetrack faster? Clearly, from the standpoint of mechanical fuel injection, you could know what the valve temperature is of every valve and every cylinder, and there wouldn't be a fucking thing you could do about it uh, other than maybe make a mixture change on the next run. Uh, and even that would be questionable. So um, valve temperature itself, uh, is intake valve temperature anyway, is very important as far as determining, once again, that trapped density of, of air and fuel mixture in the cylinder when the valve's closed. When the intake valve's hot, the air and the fuel both have to go across it. They absorb some of the heat from the valve, uh, and the valve temperature is a good indicator of what's going on in the cylinder uh, or what the cylinder is going to actually see. But how do you get there a uh, chance to measure it? And lots of factory engine control systems attempt to model the valve temperature based on air-fuel ratio, coolant temperature, uh, and the amount of time that they've sustained load and the amount of load that they've sustained. And I think that that's, that's uh, an interesting thing to have a look at, and it potentially could do a better job um, than what we're currently doing by measuring uh, temperatures and pressures not right by the, by the intake valve. Um, but at the end of the day, you would need to see either an improvement in the ability to control the air-fuel ratio or an increase in horsepower because of your ability to control the air fuel ratio um, before it would be worth putting it on on a race car you know and then of course you have the the added uh, thing of complexity right the more sensors you have the more opportunity you have for something to fail and if you're reliant on 20 different sensor inputs all it takes is one of them to screw up if you haven't accounted for what happens when that one screws up it shoots the whole mess down, right? So there's a balance, obviously, between what's good as far as trying to learn and understand and what you actually or what has an actual effect on on the thing that you're trying trying to accomplish, which, you know, in this case is making the car quick and fast and consistent and, you know, something you can run more than once in a row without having to rebuild. Right on. Well, uh, we're at the two hour and one minute mark is what the thing here on Facebook is telling me. So uh, I think it was good. I think it was fun. I hope we didn't put everybody to sleep and uh, hope gave some people some stuff to uh, go back and kind of re-listen and learn and whatnot. I learned a lot and I uh, really, uh, again, appreciate you taking the time to uh, come out here and talk a little bit of racing and uh, talk some uh, fuel injection and kind of compare notes to, you know, our two different worlds of uh, fuel injection. Yeah, I appreciate, again, the opportunity. It was fun to uh, sort of kick ideas back and forth and see how the other half lives, as it were. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, we both learned that, uh, uh, you know, we're you know we're still achieving the same result and uh, still uh, either one's only as good as how they're set up. So, uh, you know, there's a, definitely uh, you got to know what you're doing to set up an EFI system properly is what I've learned, and it's a lot more to it than uh, – being a quote unquote uh, easy uh, set it forget it type of deal, and uh, definitely the same is true on the MFI side of things. But when you get them right, you can kind of manage them pretty easy, uh, you know, so to speak. So uh, again, uh, thanks to uh, Shane Tecklenburg, tuned by Shane T, uh, noted EFI tuner. Uh, wish you the best. Hope you are staying safe. Hope everybody out there is staying safe. Uh, uh, continue prayers and thoughts for everybody out there as we kind of weather this out and stay at home and try to. Uh, come out on the other side okay and get back to uh, racing uh, meanwhile those of you that uh, may not be uh, familiar with uh, what we do over in the top alcohol world check us out inside top alcohol.com on the web inside top alcohol on facebook check out our top alcohol and series uh, we've been kind of doing a uh, reality show kind of following a couple of teams uh, through uh, through the weekend and uh, we you know had our last episode out there in pomona unfortunately we hadn't uh, had had a chance to uh, do any of them, but we got a couple of uh, episodes from last year uh, from uh, Indy and uh, Charlotte. Some uh, some really cool stuff, mixture of in-car cameras, uh, on-track footage from NHRA. So uh, check out Top Alcohol, and if you hadn't had a chance to, uh, uh, you know, definitely as good as any of the, uh, the Tiger King or any of the other stuff uh, out there on the uh, reality <laughs> TV uh, world, so to speak. And you ain't got to worry about uh, that old gal Carol Baskins on, on my show. So uh uh, anyway, thanks again, Shane Tecklenburg. Um, check us out. Keep on following us. Hit that like button inside Top Alcohol. 
follow Shane T at uh, Tuned by Shane T. Uh, I think he has a website with Tuned by Shane T.com. You got it. Check him out there if you need any EFI help, uh, race car help. Uh, definitely just one sharp uh, race car guy all the way around. Again, this was fun. Uh, maybe we'll uh, figure out, get together, and uh, do something else, talk something else uh, it's somewhere in the near future. Um, I'm afraid uh, for the near future, that's all about what we're going to be able to do is talk. Yeah, unfortunately, I wish we were talking about this like we usually are at a racetrack with our beer in our hand after a day of running race cars down the track. But it is what it is. Everybody's in the same boat. Um, man, if you guys enjoy it, let us know. Share. Keep asking questions on the, uh, on, on the, on the chat there. I'll go ahead and answer any questions that I see that are posted with the video. And, uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. appreciate the opportunity. All right, folks. So, well, that's a wrap. Inside Top Alcohol Live. Hit that like button. Hit that share button. We're going to make Top Alcohol great again.